everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for our second installation of UEB webinars. This time we're delving into UEB and math and also including Nemeth. This webinar though, specifically, we are just addressing UEB. On the second webinar, we will be addressing Nemeth and UEB. And then the third webinar, we're going to talk about some decision making and share some resources with you all. Uh, the opening code for today is one, O-N-E, one. Let me get to the agenda. Okay. Um, gave you the opening code. Introductions, you know who I am. I'm Andrea Wallace, and I'm a district resource teacher here at the Florida Instructional Materials Center. Previously, I taught in Pinellas County Schools and also at the Lighthouse that serves Pasco, Hernando, and Citrus Counties. And I have with me today, of course, Kathy Krumkleski, who is our UEB guru in the state of Florida. So we are so lucky to have her. Anything you want to share about yourself, Kathy? Um, no, you pretty much covered it other than um, I, for 17 years, I was a TVI in Hillsborough County. So before switching over to be a district resource teacher here at Florida, uh, Florida Instructional Materials Center. And we are so lucky to have her here and her expertise. Um, practice rules and homework, kind of the same as the previous UEB webinars. We're going to give you guys a few minutes to do the practice homework. I don't believe we have as many practice sessions in this one, but they're lengthier. And they'll probably take you a little bit longer because it's really hard. And Kathy and I were just discussing this to turn off your Nemeth brain, it is super difficult. So um, you might be doing a lot of erasing or um, backspacing. Um, after, uh, well, first we're gonna address just the facts, a little bit of history and why some decisions were made about um, UEB numbers. We're gonna talk about some research that has been done. And then we're going to get into an overview of UEB math symbols. And then we're gonna just show you the resources that um, Kathy primarily used to build this awesome PowerPoint. So what we wanna accomplish, of course, is we wanna debunk any myths out there. As of January 4th, UEB is here to stay. It was the official implement implementation date of the code. So EBAE is no longer a viable code in the United States. It's UEB, Nemeth, and the music code. Uh, if you haven't started thinking about UEB, we wanted to give you a starting point. If you're already deep into it, we wanted to hope to give you a continuing point. We hope that you learn some basic symbols for math from this webinar uh, using UEB, and we want to answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to stop us and ask questions as we go. Oh, wait. <laughs> Before we go any further, I want to do a little pre-test. Okay, so if everybody can answer these questions for me, I'm opening up the polls now. Get these all open. Oh, you can't read all the questions, can you? Oh, yes, you can. Okay, so number one, UEB symbols only go up to an elementary level of math. True or false? Number two, the decision to use upper numbers in UEB was taken very lightly. Number three, there has been no research done regarding UEB. Number four, UEB and UEB math are two distinct codes. Number five, UEB always makes a document 50% longer, true or false. And then I asked, if, what trainings have you participated, participated in related to UEB? Um, there's the UEBot training, UEB online, if you attended working with the experts in 2014, 2015, taken a university class, um, attended our last webinar series, you can select any or all of those, whatever you have participated in. And then I'm uh, curious to know just which code are you teaching your students to read to access math and science at this time? Nimeth, UEB, or both? And then, of course, our last question is, what is your burning question regarding UEB for math and science? And hopefully it's something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We hope to answer this question with those, these three webinars, right, Kathy? <laughs> yes, that is the goal. 
Good question. <laughs> I'll give everybody a few minutes to see how many people are here. I'll give you guys another second to answer these. Last I heard, we were keeping Nemeth. Well, we will hopefully demystify some of these questions for you. And this is also an ever-changing situation, too. So, yeah, it continues to evolve as it does around the entire country. Um, this is new to all of us, and we're the only country who has decided to keep Nemeth as well as UEB, so we're in uncharted territory. And many, many states are going back and forth and, and trying to figure out what exactly to do. It makes writing a state implementation plan very hard. <laughs> All right, so I think everybody has had a chance to answer. So we'll talk to you. We gotta do the webcams again. Oh, yeah. Always forget it turns off our webcam when we go between different uh, layouts. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so some facts about uh, math with UEB. Uh, did you know? UEB was primarily developed by Braille readers, and they were there was actually a group of Braille readers from seven different countries that were involved in the development of UEB. Um, UEB was also designed to unify all English-speaking countries and all subjects and types of material. So the whole purpose was to kind of create a general purpose code. And as we discussed in the previous webinars, that in 1991, Dr. Abraham Nimeth and Dr. Or, and Timothy Cramner um, wrote a proposal to unify, make a unified code in the United States. Um, and did you know that UEB can successfully represent all levels of mathematics and science? And Kathy's going to address this a little bit further when she talks about some research that has been done on UEB. And with that being said, I'm turning this over to Kathy. All right. So um, I, it, when we had the working with the experts with Dr. DeAndrea and Dr. Holbrook, um, they mentioned in that the research that Canada had done. And so I wanted to find out more information. And so that's what I dug up. So it was the United Unified English Braille Code Examination by Science, Mathematics, and Computer Science Technical Expert Braille Readers. And it's an article published in the Journal of Visual Impairment and Blindness, if you have access to that journal. The citation is at, at the very end, so you can find the exact thing. It's very interesting reading. Um, I'm just going to do an overview of it and cover some of the important facts, but there was a lot of stuff in there. So essentially, they took f five technical experts. They have tried to find as many as they could, um, but they were only able to get five that met all the criteria. So three were from the US and two were from Canada. And I always want to know, okay, well, who are these people? What did they do? So um, their profession is first. So we had an associate scientist who had a PhD. There was a middle school math teacher who has a bachelor's and a master's in education in math. There's a software, uh, senior software, engine, uh, software designer who had a bachelor's in science. And then a manager of XML transformation and query development that has a master's degree in computer science and an accessibility specialist with the same degree. So, but they were looking for participants who were Braille readers employed in highly technical fields with limited knowledge of the UEB code and no strong opinion pro or con about UEB code. So that's where it's very hard to find someone that meets all of those criteria. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so the procedure for what they did is they had a two-day meeting face-to-face where they had each of these individuals do four tasks. In the first task, um, they read nine samples from high school science textbooks, such as physics and chemistry, mathematics, such as calculus and computer science, that were transcribed into UEB without any instruction about the code, including they were not given access to any of the symbol lists. And they were using a think aloud method, where as they read, they would express what they were thinking um, and uh, how they figured things out and that kind of thing. And with this first task, at, then at the completion of each passage, the participants had the opportunity to examine a list of symbols that had been compiled with the meaning 
of each of the UEB symbols indicated in the passage. So the very first one, they had never seen UEB at all. They had no symbols, and they had to do it without anything. Then after that passage, they could look at the symbols list. Then they were given the next thing, and so on. Um, and as the participants read more passages, the study noted that they often remembered what they learned from the list of symbols in the previous passages. So this pretty much, they were kind of teaching themselves UEB a little bit as they were going through and reading these things. Then the task two was to listen to a short 60-minute UEB instructional tape and examine the accompanying materials that were produced in UEB code. The third task, which was similar to task one in how it was done, was they um, got a work sample from each of their, um, either the employers of these people or the colleagues, and they took that work sample, something they would ordinarily read in their daily job, and put it into UEB and had them read it and use the think aloud method while they were reading it. And then at the end, they brought all the participants together and did a focus group um, to discuss the UEB code and the research tasks that they just did. So some of the results that they found were that the Braille readers who participated in the study noted that UEB code is understandable and represents technical information. So cold turkey without any information, they were able to figure it out. Um, they were also able to read the UEB samples from various technical areas and their um, skill level improved with practice, which makes sense. Also, all five participants believed that the UEB code would provide appropriate access to higher level technical material for Braille readers. Um, limitations of the study, obviously it was difficult to recruit the participants um, that met the criteria and therefore there was a small sample size. Um, and although the participants were exposed to the UEB code during the study, they obviously didn't master the use of the code. I don't know about any of you, but I still feel like I'm continuing to master the code, and I will continue. I'm not an expert by any means. I just need more and more learning, and I get better every day. Um, but because of that, all of their opinions are based on their limited experience and understanding of the code and activities. They might have different opinions or different information to give once they had a much stronger base in UEB. Okay, any questions about the first study before we go into the second one? I don't see anybody typing, so. All right, so the second one that I ran across, and there are a few others, um, was the Unified English Braille in the United Kingdom, Part 1, Examination by Technical Expert Braille Users. And this was published in the British Journal of Visual Impairment. And this really was, they took the study that, the first study that we just went over, by Dr. Holbrook and McCuspy, and reproduced it in Britain in a slightly different format. Um, so they replicated it, but they focused the investigation on how the technical Braille users in the UK would do um, and wanted their, their views on changing to UEB. Uh, the same materials were used. Whoops. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> The same technical materials were used, um, and they did it in the summer of 2011, so it was a little bit later. All right, All right so their participants, they had six participants, um, were um, Braille experts. They had a student with technical expertise in math. They didn't define it any more than this. Um, they had another student that was a, um, had expertise in math and physics. There was one sighted teacher with technical expertise in math that was a um, math teacher, I think, at a residential type school. Um, and then they had, a braille re she was, they had a braille reader that was a reader, teacher, transcriber with technical expertise in math, and then a braille reader with technical expertise in math and computing, and a braille reader with technical expertise in computing. All right, so procedure. Um, the first part they did the same with the same nine samples from the school, um, from the different science textbooks um, and transcribed it into UEB and did the think aloud process and then recorded it. Um, then they did it a little bit different. They had participants were invited to read and comment on the UEB symbols list for the sample and then they were interviewed about their experience. So they didn't do a focus group or anything, they interviewed them individually. Then they took all the information from those interviews and they did a thematic analysis and used it to determine the key themes in answering uh, in the arising in the data. And with this, because it was a qualitative approach, 
and it was aimed at a breadth of data. They wanted to get as much information as they could about it. Um, they reported something even if only one participant mentioned it. So whatever the participants mentioned, it got written down and it was considered into a category. All right, so some of the key findings. Here, all the participants felt that they were able to read the UEB technical coding despite having no access to the symbols list. Um, and in fact, some of the participants commented that the task was harder than, quote, real life, as they were asked to read the samples without access to the symbols list or teaching on any, or any teaching on what they were. Um, if UEB were adopted, users would have had access to coding information to refer to while they're learning the new code. So the task was a lot harder than if they were really learning it to implement it. Um, the participants liked the idea of uniting the codes for literary and technical material because it was easier for people to read technical material in Braille, make production easier, make technical Braille material more mainstream, and make it easier to read technical information produced in other countries. These were some of the comments they said. Um, the fact and also the article pointed out the fact that four out of the six were supportive of the move to UEB may demonstrate that while technical users appear to be those who would be most affected by that um, by the changes to the UEB perhaps they could also be seen as the ones with the most to gain um, as you can see four out of the six supported the move one was against it adopting UEB and one didn't really want to use UEB themselves but they could see some benefits um, let's see, then they thought also a factor, um, perhaps they could also be seen as the ones with most, uh, they thought that you have also the factor in the UK was planning on using UEB as the only Braille code, unlike the US where we retain both UEB and Nemeth. So in the UK, it, they were switching to UEB without keeping any other code. All right, so limitations, the same limitations on this. It was difficult to recruit enough participants, and because of that, the small sample size, it's very hard to generalize these findings to all technical Braille readers. But that's in our field, that is a common problem, is finding enough people that you can have a large enough sample size. Um, and like the other one, there's a lot more information in this article that we don't have time to cover. Um, but like I said, I cited it at the end. So if you really are interested in finding out more information, I found them very interesting to read. Um, you can look it up in the information and look on that on your own. Any questions or anything so far? I don't see anybody typing, so we'll go on. Okay, now one of the big things about UEB, and I think probably the sticking point for many people, of was why upper numbers, upper numbers versus lower numbers. Because um, it's just so nice with Nemeth to distinguish between letters and numbers when you drop the numbers down. But they did put a lot of thought into it. Um, I looked through from the BANA website, the International Council on English Braille, Unified English Braille Project from the Committee to Archives, the second debate on the numbers. It's very lengthy. Um, and I was actually looking for the study they did on the textbooks. and I. Didn't find that there, but I found some other information. Um, and then I found what I was looking for later. So we're going to get to that. But during this period, um, the committee for this, looking into deciding about the upper numbers, was committee two. And it was comprised of the following members. So in the US, it was Tim Cramner, Abraham Nemeth, Emerson Falk, and Joseph Sullivan. In addition to them, there was one representative from the Republic of South Africa, one from Australia, one from the United Kingdom, and one from New Zealand. Now, with these, five out of the eight original members were Braille consumers. In the current group, there's seven out of the eight members that are consumers. And each committee has also has an educator who teaches Braille, and also is represent, they also have someone representing Braille producers and transcribers. Um, so with the committees, they try, do make sure they try to cover every perspective. All right, so pretty much the whole debate with all the numbers and, and when they were trying to figure out which numbering system to use, they had three options to choose from. And in that, this long list of discussions and stuff like that, it, and in the article we're going to get into in a minute, it pretty much boils down to these kind of pros and cons for each type of numbering system. So the first one was using upper numbers. 
And some some of the pros for using upper numbers was that everybody knew. Every country used upper numbers so everybody would know them. Um, in ordinary text, they did not need special indicators, and they're not confused with punctuation. Okay, But cons, since upper numbers and the letters A through J can be confused, like we all know, there's inefficiency when numbers and letters are written together, what they call number-letter combinations, or one of the articles called it juxtapositions. Um, so that was the pros and cons with the upper numbers. Then the next thing they considered was lower numbers. Um, lower numbers, the pros were it solves the issue of different, differentiating letters from numbers, which is great with like polynomials and things like that. Um, the sim Braille symbol shape is the same, so it's easily read by those who know upper numbers because it's just the same shape dropped to the lower cell. Some of the cons, though, since lower numbers and punctuation can be confused, you need indicators whenever numbers are in contact with punctuation. So that's that number punctuation combination. Um, and these are some of the main reasons. They, there were some additional strengths and weaknesses, like they did note um, upper numbers were traditional and lower numbers and the other numbers weren't traditional. Um, but we are, like I said, we can't get into every little part of that, this, um, but you can find them if you go to that website and you can read all the information. Okay, then the third choice was what they called French dot six or Antoine numbers. Um, and these numbers, I actually didn't understand until I read the, um, one of the articles, they used the shape of the upper numbers one through nine but within the same cell, they added a dot six. So if you take like number one, which is dot one, and you add a dot six, it's the ch sign essentially. So these were the these were the French Antoine numbers, okay? And then they had a different configuration for the zero. Well, a pro, some of the pros of these numbers, and at first they started to dismiss this, but then they started to really consider these. Um, with these Antoine numbers, you don't need a number sign, you don't need Braille punctuation indicators, and you don't have any problems with um, needing letter signs. They're very distinct. Um, and no matter what the context, including grade one or grade two, the numbers were readable and couldn't be confused. Um, but the major con, um, reading of these numbers was found to slow down fluency a little bit, at least initially, for a lot of Braille readers, especially if they weren't used to them. And the big thing, and I think the main reason why these end, did not end up being chosen, is it would mean we would have to give up 10 strong symbols. So we would, if we used the Antoine or dot six numbers, we would have to have given up CH, GH, SH, TH, WH, ED, ER, OU, and OW. Um, and everybody decided that that was going to be too much to, to change from EBAE, from English Braille American Edition, from the old code. Um, now, another thing that one of the articles pointed out was with these French dot six numbers, the number of cells required to represent these numbers, even when they were in combination with letters or punctuation, would be the lowest of all the options. So it would save the most space. But again, I mean, we know a lot of us are having enough trouble dropping nine contractions, let alone if we were to drop all of the, these very frequently used contractions. Okay, so this led to, this was the actual article that I was looking for, and it was the deciding factor came from a comparison of the frequency of number punctuation and number letter combinations in literary and technical materials. And I've got the website there um, so you can get it yourself and read through the whole thing. Um, it was done, the study was done by the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, CNIB, in 2002 through its Library of, for the Blind. The, um, there was a gentleman who developed a computer program um, that counted the number of occurrences of number letter and number punctuation combinations in regular superscript and superscript subscript positions. But it didn't, that's not in counting the page numbers. And so they took 16 textbooks um, where they analyzed 8,429 pages. Um, and they list the textbooks in the article if you're curious. Because I know when I heard about these studies and stuff like that, that's what I wanted to know. I was like, well, which, which books did they choose? What kind of books did they choose? And that kind of thing. 
Um, Ten were literary code textbooks, so they took 3,873 pages from that. And nine were Nemeth code textbooks, and they took 4,556 pages from that. And the article, like I said, contains a list of the books that were used for the study, which is, it did include a chemistry book and a calculus book. And the titles were selected that had a cons considerable number of numerals. They were looking for things that had a lot of numbers in them. And no copyright was older than 10 years. So, conclusions. Okay. Um, the results indicate that a greater, num a greater amount of number punctuation combinations happen than number letter combinations in all texts. So it's more often that you're going to see a number next to a punctuation mark, like a period, than you are going to see a number next to a letter, like 3A. Um, thus, more punctuation indicators, 20,735, were required when lower numbers are used versus letter signs, 499, when upper numbers are used in our current code. Okay? Then when you put UEB into the mix, um, when UEB rules are applied, the number of letter signs needed drops to 212 with no punctuation indicators needed. So the choice came down to you could, with UEB, if UEB were to use lower numbers, you'd be using 20,735 more punctuation indicators. Or by using upper numbers, you didn't need punctuation indicators, but you'd only have 212 letter signs. And there is a lot of ins and outs with this, and the article does go into it. Um, so the incidence of punctuation indicators required in the Nemeth occurs 97.81 times more as frequently as the letter sign in UEB. Um, and this article... I already read that. Okay. So any questions about that and why they decided to go with upper numbers or any of the other research? I know it's background information and that kind of thing, but I think it helps to understand. I know for me it helped to know that it wasn't just an arbitrary decision, that they really had a basis for why they did it um, and there was reasoning behind it. All right. Then let, we're going to slide into covering the rest of the U, UEB. Um, basically, with technical materials, um, and this is what Dr. DeAndrea was uh, stressing a lot, you follow the same symbols and rules as non-technical materials, creating consistency of the rules across contexts. Remember, um, for spacing, most of the time you're going to follow the print. Um, but UEB does give some... Uh, leniency or flexibility with spacing. Um, the standalone rule, remember the two most important rules in UEB, the standalone rule and the grade one rule, grade one mode rules, those still apply and you apply those and then from there it's a lot of just plugging in the symbols that match the print. Um, now noting, and I used to say this myself, there is not a UEB math code, it's just UEB. UEB that will do math, science, whatever. It's one code to handle every subject. Unified English Braille was designed to unify all English countries and all the different subject materials. So whenever we're referring to it, we need to refer to UEB or UEB with Nemeth, because the Nemeth gets incorporated into the UEB context. Exactly. And it's just um, important that people will say UEB math, it is just what it is. It's UEB and BANA adopted that whole code. Just Not just part of it, they adopted UEB, so it means the whole entire code. So keep that in mind as we go through um, these three webinars. All right, so this is information we've covered in the other webinars, but in case we have someone joining us brand new, and just to review, um, numbers used with letters and punctuation marks, Remember the following symbols may occur in numeric mode. These symbols don't cancel numeric mode. And remember I said it's easier to remember what does not cancel numeric mode than it is the long list of everything that does cancel it. So for numeric mode, you can write the 10 digits, 0 through 9, period, comma, the simple numeric fraction line, which we'll talk about today, the numeric space digit symbol we'll see today, and the two line continuation indicators. So. Here's your first challenge. Write, there's three numbers at the bottom, three things at the bottom of the screen. 
see who's the first one that can say what those Braille symbols are. I see lots of people typing. All right, yep, four point B. Yes, good, Andrea. That's the first one. All right, isn't that a sick? I'm sick. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. I'm tired, and <laughs> I have a horrible problem with reversing my fours and my sixes. Those get me every time. Zeros and eights are my problem. <laughs> All right, so yes, and then one thousand comma five hundred thirty-four, and whoop, everybody's got it. So good. Good job. Um, now, one thing, I know this is the only way you can represent it, but just to kind of clarify, and we're going to talk about this more, um, that 79 slash 80, technically for it to be just a simple fraction, it's going to be, think it, it would be one over the other, okay? And we'll talk more about that when we get to fractions, but there is a distinction with that. But I know typing, this is the only way you can represent it. And this is the simple fraction indicator here. Great job, everybody. I see everybody getting those right. Okay, so then also remember that numeric mode is terminated by a space, a hyphen, a dash, an apostrophe, and a colon. So when numbers are interrupted by the above symbols, numeric mode is terminated, and the numeric indicator must be repeated when writing the rest of these numbers. Okay? So let's look at these and see what these are. Go ahead and type in what they are. See lots of people typing. That's good. Yeah, good. One or three, that's right. And yes, four hyphen eight. And that it's not eight hyphen one five p.m. Yeah, there we go. It's 8 colon 1 5 p.m. 8 15. Yep, so now whenever we write the time or the date, we got to repeat that number sign because colons and hyphens cancel numeric mode. So you got to start numeric mode again. All right, more of you are getting it. Great. Excellent job. Any questions about that? Awesome. See, you guys got this. UEB ain't hard to do. Okay. Now, grade one mode indicator is not needed when letters follow numbers unless a letter is A through J, which could be confused with a number. In the following example, a grade one indicator should be placed directly in front of the letter, okay? So let's go for having you write these up and then what these mean and we'll go See lots of people typing so it's great all right good yeah we got 5b and then 5 capital B and then 5 hyphen B, and then 5M. Excellent, yes. Um, now, notice with the five, first one, 5 grade 1 indicator B, you have to have that, otherwise it'd be 52. Um, then with the next one, you've got 5 capital B. Well, the reason you don't need that grade 1 indicator is because you'd never have a capital number. So that cannot be confused for anything but a capital B. So there you don't need it. Remember, with grade one indicators, you only put them where they're needed. When something could be confused for something else, that's a huge thing in UEB and especially in the math, using UEB for math. Okay, then in the next one, we've got five hyphen and then that B. Can anybody, I know you all are, some of you are still putting what the information is, but why do you need a grade one indicator there? Going back to our other webinars. Well, um, no, that's a good guess, Sarah, but you wouldn't read it as a 2 because it would be 5 hyphen and then a B. 
that hyphen cancels numeric mode, so for it'd have to have another number sign to be a two. Good, Mary. Yes, it's not. It's standing alone. So if you did not have that grade one indicator, it would be five hyphen but. Um, yes, good, Teresa. It'd be but. Okay. And then the 5M, there's no way that M can be confused with anything else, and so therefore you don't need the grade one indicator. Okay, Sarah, good. I'm glad you got that. All right, now let's look at the next part, the fo um, follow the print copy for use of apostrophes with numbers. And this just gives you some different ideas of where that apostrophe could be and could go. And I see you all type in. Good, yep, we got the five apostrophe S, fives, 1950s. A lot of you got it. Great job. And then the apostrophe 30s. Mm -hmm. Well done, everybody. All right, and then, okay, so numbers that the numeric indicator also, uh, remember that the numeric indicator also sets grade one mode, but different things terminate it. Okay, so you got the numeric indicator. It starts at the same time, grade one mode and numeric mode. Um, but grade one mode that started by the numeric indicator is only terminated by a space, hyphen, or dash. Okay? Um, but as long as you have contractions in there, um, grade one mode is going to be in effect. So here's, a, here's two web addresses. Um, why don't you type what those are and then we can talk about them. See lots of people typing, which is good. Okay, Carol, yes, you got star7 at att.net. Mm -hmm. And Teresa, good. You got seven eight t. Uh, oh wait, seven star. Be seven star at att dot net. Yep, there you go. All right. So notice in the first one, you you can use the contraction st and ar, and then you have the number sign seven, and then you've got the at symbol and att.net, and there's nothing contracted after that. But notice when you move that 7 in front of the word star, all of a sudden now, that numeric indicator starts grade 1 mode, and you therefore you have to spell out star. You can't use the contractions because the, grade, the, num, the numeric indicator started grade 1 mode, and the only thing that cancels grade 1 mode is a space hyphen or dash. So, Teresa, you were asking if you should have spelled it out. That's okay. I understand, Teresa. Instead of the letters. Yep. Okay. Now, getting into, this is stuff we did not cover in the other webinars because we were saving it for the math section. The signs of operation. Okay. All of the signs of operation begin with the prefix dot five, which we put in red to try and make it easier. So, and this takes a little getting used to, and as Andrea said before, I know I, I was actually surprised, but it is harder for me to switch gears and get my brain to do math in UEB versus the Nemeth. It was harder to switch from Nemeth to UEB than to switch from EBAE to UEB, because my brain just automatically wants to do Nemeth. I found that, I found that reading it. it is a lot harder than typing it. I don't know if it's because I'm sitting there trying to be more conscious about it, but when I'm reading it and like interlining, that's where I fall apart and none of the symbols make sense. I'm like, no, wait, that's a plus sign. No, it's not. <laughs> but anyway, um, signs of cooperation. It looks like we've got a lot of people agreeing too. Carol, oh, same oh, thing, <laughs> Sarah. Yep, who knew that we've got Nemeth farther ingrained. 
So, okay, so your plus sign, you've got the dot five followed by the two, three, uh, two, three, five. For the minus, it's the same minus sign with just a dot five in front of it. That's nice. For the multiplication, x sign, it's dot five followed by two, three, six. For the multiplication dot, it's dot five followed by two, five, six. And for the division, it's the same division sign pretty much with a dot five before it. Okay, then notice with the prefixes for signs of comparison, we've got for the equals, it's a dot five as well. It's a dot five with a lower G essentially, two, three, five, six. Um, but then if you look at the greater than and less than, that one's different. That has a prefix of a dot four with the one, two, six, and dot four with the three, four, five. Um, okay, let's see. Esther, you're asking, will APH and FIMC be producing the new math books then in UEB only? Um, that's what we're going to, that's some of the stuff we'll discuss in the third webinar. Um, and there's no hard and fast rule at this moment. Um, it's an evolving situation, especially as we're waiting. We'll hopefully we'll have at some point soon a Florida State plan for implementation. Right now, what, right we're, now, looking what we're looking at, Esther, is it's very complicated, <laughs> but it's an IEP team decision. If you do order a newly adopted math book in UEB, Understand. understand that it's probably going to take a little bit longer to get those materials. Um, if you, well, with newly, well, newly adopted, maybe not. It might take the same amount of time, but you need to adopt them as, or um, order them as soon as possible if you do want them in UEB. Um, which you have the capability of ordering UEB from our online ordering system. But if you order, but if you order a previously transcribed textbook, it would take a lot longer to get that as opposed to having it already to rock on the shelf with Nimeth. Does that make sense? That causes gray hair. <laughs> it's the nature of the beast right now, Teresa, and it's temporary. <laughs> it's, it's an evolving thing right now, but eventually there will be um, a resolution. Any other questions about ordering books? Yeah, I see. No, no. Don't go on yet. All right, um, but I have a question now, okay? In thinking about what we covered in the other webinars, if you had joined us, okay, if we look at that, our dot five prefix, we had it dot five for all of the um, operation signs and the comparison signs, but why is the greater than and less than different? Can anybody think of why that starts with a dot four? Grouping, yes, excellent, Sarah, and Karen, yep, and yeah, and Mary, yes, they're parentheses as well, they're angle brackets, or angle parentheses, um, so yeah, that's why those are a little different from the rest, um, and they, the reason that they do the same thing is because in print, they look the same, so if you see them, um, and actually we'll go into the next slide, because this gets illustrated in the next slide. Okay, so signs of operation and comparison start with dot five, so they're hopefully easier to remember, um, with the exception of the less than and the greater than signs, which start with the dot four prefix. Because note, the dot four are the angle bra um, brackets, and they're used the same in print. They look the same in print, and so in Braille, they're the same symbol. Um, and when you use signs of comparison, Remember, there's a space on either side. So with equals, greater than, or less than, you'll have a space on either side. But if you're using the angle brackets as um, a grouping symbol, then there won't be a space between it and the next symbol. So if you look there, we've got numbers, the 50 divided by 5 equals 10. So you've got number sign, 5, 0, the division sign, and then number sign again because signs of operation cancel numeric mode so you have to start numeric mode again so the number sign five then space the equal sign space number ten eight times three equals twenty four and we're following the print spacing there number sign eight um, then you have the UEB times x sign 
and then number sign again because the operation sign cancels numeric mode, so number sign 3, space equals space 24. Then we've got 92 is greater than 83, and there's space between each of them. But then look at that www.localnews.net. The angle brackets on the left and the right, so the, the less than sign on the left and the greater than sign on the right are touching that because it's being used as a grouping symbol, not as a sign of comparison. Any questions on that? Nope, okay, then let's move on. Okay, so some more examples. Um, the, with, because it's a unified code, you just use it wherever it appears. So if it appears inside of a book, um, a literary book, like our Romeo plus Juliet equals tragic love, you just put the signs where they go. You put the words and then slip in the, the plus sign, put in the equal sign, and off you go. And notice just a little review, we've got the um, capital word indicator, the 2.6 is in front of the tragic in love. Okay, and now like I said, UEB allows some flexibility with spacing. Generally, you would do whatever it shows in print. So the first one, 1 plus 1 equals 2. 1 plus 1 is all put together, there's no space. And then there's space around the equals. In the second one, 1 plus 1 equals 2, there's a space between each part of it, and so it follows the print. But there is a strong preference to remove, space, remove spaces around signs of operation and keep spacing around signs of comparison. So the preference if, is mostly to have the operation signs right next to the numbers and spacing around the comparison signs. However, in the UEB rulebook, it does say that teachers have the option, if preparing simple problems for young children, it's permissible to space around all the signs including the signs of operation. Um, okay, so if you if they were used in this literary stuff, would you not use contractions? Um, it, you would use the contractions, Mary, as long as there wasn't like a numeric indicator or something that would put you in grade one mode that would cancel the, um, that would make it so you couldn't use the contraction. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so we're at our first exercise. Here are some things for you to braille. Are we doing two minutes or three minutes? Three minutes. Three. Starting. No. Watch out for those Nemeth symbols. They like to sneak in there. No problem, Linda.
we have about one minute left. Fifteen seconds. All right, time's up. Move on to the answers. And pause here for just a minute. I just want to go over a couple things. And it, if you didn't get it done, don't worry. I mean, I know it's it's still slow, very slow for me, too, doing the math to make sure to try and get the right symbols and remember to put the num numeric indicator in again and things like that. A um, couple of things I just wanted to point out. Notice with the um, a number three with the 12 remainder two, you've got the R number sign two, but you don't need the grade one indicator there because the R is touching the two. And so you cannot be confused with the contraction. Rather, it's not standing alone. Um, that caught me, I think, the first time I did this um, exercise. Another thing I wanted to point out is on that last one, um, you've got to watch where you need the grade one indicators. So you've got that 4C. You need it there so it doesn't become 43. Um, but then you don't need it for the Y. And then look at that grade one indicator with the question mark. Um, this can stump you up too. But remember, if that is all by itself and there's nothing next to it, it could be the contraction his. That one, tri that one tripped me up earlier today. <laughs> so you use a grade one indicator whenever it's needed to keep something from being confused. And that's going to be the theme and the mantra today over and over and over again. Any questions about any of these? How'd y'all feel about it? Got Teresa typing. All right, multiple attendees. That's what we like. Full cell to represent the question mark. Um, because in the print, it had a question mark, and it didn't have a blank. I think usually you use the um, full braille cell when it's representing the blank I, maybe if it's a blank but I I know in UEB you, you follow the print so if there's a question mark you put a question mark and when I can't remember the rules exactly but when you have a blank space but it's like underlined um, you use the hyphen or was it the long the long dash to represent that blank line or was there a specific Underscore. 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 That's what I was looking for. Not um, um, but, yeah, it's, but yeah, it's the, um, you, just follow, you the just follow the print. At least to the best of our knowledge, because remember, Teresa, we're learning too. <laughs> so to the best of our knowledge. And uh, Sarah, I understand what you mean about the equals. When I first did this, I did an exercise like this in the workshop. I just happily went along my way doing, I did not even think. And I had all of my equals were the Nemeth equal signs. Do you have to repeat the numeric indicator? Okay, Pamela, the reason you have to repeat the numeric indicator after the um, operation sign is because an operation sign cancels numeric mode. Remember, and that's why I said the, it's easier to remember what doesn't cancel numeric mode. Everything cancels numeric mode except numbers, the simple fraction line, the comma, the numeric space, and the decimal point or period. Everything else cancels it. Any other questions about any of these answers before we move on? I see Pam is typing.
Yeah, that's it's something with it's with UEB that you have to get used to. Yeah, that you end up putting the numeric indicator a lot more. Um. So, but that's that's the way the rules are with that, it. That's the, that's number, the indicator. number indicator. So, because remember, those could be A through J without that numeric indicator. So that's why they repeat so often. Okay. So now they also do spatial format and kind of getting into the spatial format, but there is flexibility given with the spatial format problems. Okay, so here's the print, and then on the next slide we're going to see the Braille. Um, so that's why there's 123 plus 14 equals 37 written twice. It's On the next page you'll see it written two different ways. In Braille, and I forget um, Dr. D'Andrea was talking about it, um, there was a certain name, but for... Um, Maybe it was the Australian way. I can't remember now off the top of my head. But um, in this middle way of doing things spatially, the placement of the plus sign is moved. It was Australia. It was Australia? Okay. It was moved, and it just was one was easier for some Braille readers to read it this way. Um, just also for you to note, there is a line mode. Remember, UEB is all about our different modes. Um, that is a dot five and then two fives, but there's flexibility on how long the dividing line is. You can see the technical guidelines um, for the materials, but, and I was asking Dr. D'Andrea that, is, you know, is there a hard and fast rule of where do you start that line? Does it go underneath the multiplication, like in the multiplication problem, does it go underneath the multiplication sign or underneath the first number? Does it have to hang over one? And there's some general guidelines, but she said, if you look at different examples, you'll see different things. And so UEB is not as strict as Nemeth is about it has to be in this specific cell or this specific length and that kind of thing. There is a little bit more flexibility with this. And I personally really love the flexibility that you will see on the next slide with how these spatial uh, math problems are written. I just think it's so nice because it's actually a way to make it more flexible based on your students' needs. And you have a blessing to do that. You're not breaking any rules. Okay, so let's go to the Braille. All right, so the first one is exactly how it shows in print. You've got 123 on the top. On the left side, you've got your plus sign. And then notice you line up the, num the numeric indicators, and you leave a space for that hundreds column on the second number and just put the 14. You've got your line mode, and then you've got your answer, and everything's all nicely aligned. Um, then in your second example, it's pretty much the same, except the plus sign is moved to go after the top 123. And for some Braille readers, this is easier because it just kind of flows. They read across, okay, 123 plus, and then they go to the next line. you got 14, and then the answer, 137. They've got that immediate feedback of what operation they're performing on this problem. I think that's fabulous. And then their third option is you can use, and we talked a little bit about this in the last set of webinars, there is the two numeric, indis, two numeric sign indicators together. That means it's a numeric passage. Remember a passage, well, it, that doesn't get into too much with this, but so that tells you that anything following those two numeric signs, everything following it is not going to be a contraction. It's going to be a number or something within numeric mode. And so notice that you don't need the number signs in the 1,495 times 23. All the num numeric, the number signs essentially, um, are taken out because you put it at the top. And then notice at the very bottom you have the grade one indicator followed by a dot three, which that dot three is our terminator. Arnold is back. Um, so with all the terminators, it's the symbol plus the dot three that terminates it. So that tells you, okay, we're stopping the uncontracted numeric mode thing there. I think we've got some questions. Yes. Um, Andrea Hardy wants to know, in the first example, what if the second number was a four-digit number? How would you line it up? Usually with these, I would think you would put the longest number on top, but you would just space it over 
so that all of your columns are going to align. Because the most important thing is aligning the ones with the ones, the tens with the tens, the hundreds with the hundreds, the thousands with the thousands, would be my guess. Um, now, with this, also I want to note with this um, numeric passage and stuff like that, I didn't have time and the ability to show you this, but if you look in the technical guidelines, they show at the top of the page that um, those two numeric indicators, and then they have a whole page of four problems where, like the one, two, three plus, so you can do a whole page of problems without just math problems spatially like this, and then at the end of the page, put your numeric terminator. Okay? So, to let you know that that is an option as well. I just think that's awesome. I know I would have had a high school student who would have loved to use that. <laughs> okay, let's look at the comments. Fabulous to have a symbol on the end of the first line. Uh, how will it be? And that that question did come up. Uh, I don't have Rebecca. I don't have a um, great answer necessarily for it. Um, but pretty much what they were saying, if it's a transcriber, the guess is it will probably be transcribed the first way because that follows the print. Um, but, it's but it's important, I think, to show your students all three ways so they can recognize that if they happen to get run across something that is transcribed in one of those three options. And Mary, I think they're all, those signs are always on the left, but I don't know that 100%. That's the examples I've seen in the book. And this, again, I, I know some. I feel like I know just enough to be dangerous on this stuff. Um, so I would definitely refer you to looking at the technical guidelines book and looking at the examples in there for these types of problems. Also, I have heard they are working on developing an advanced UEB transcriber course to cover things like the technical guidelines and stuff like that. Um, I have no idea when that will be ready or when it's coming out, but I have heard they are working on it. Okay, any other questions about this? Um, let me see, I had some, uh, I already, we already talked about the numeric mode passage indicator and terminator. Um, we already talked that you do want, you want all your students to see all of these different ways. And you want them to own the math. You want them to use whichever is the best way for them without overshadowing the learning of the concepts itself. You want the code to enhance them learning the concepts. Um, the first you probably see the most often, especially in textbooks, because it follows what's in print. Um, the second might be actually better. Um, and then you've got the third as well. Okay, any questions or anything? All right. right, then let's move on. And you have your own set to practice. Yay. So um, do you want them to braille it like you had it, the first example, the second example, and the, and the third example? Does that make sense? So the first one, you'll do it exactly as it's shown. The second one, you'll do it as it's shown, but you'll move that plus sign to after the 456. And the third one you'll do with the numeric passage indicator and terminator. And by the way, you could do that 456 plus 34 equals 94 with the numeric passage indicator and terminator. Um, I just chose to give you a multiplication problem to do it with because it's a little longer. You have a little more to line up and do. Um, but the example, and I think I got this one out of the um, technical guideline book, and it showed that same problem all three ways. So the numeric passage indicator could be used with that first problem as well. All right, we'll give you all about two and a half minutes to get started on these or finish them.
All right, time is up. Let's move on to the answers. I have a question, Kathy. In the last example, it shows the um, sign of operation off to the right. Um, but for that one, would that be up to user's choice? Could you have it back where it's, it goes on the left when you have the numeric passage indicator? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Okay. Okay, cool. That's cool. Oh. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's see if we get any questions. Maybe not. Okay. Oh, stop. Can't hear you. You're you're muted. I think. Sorry. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Hear some of the explanation on the last slide. The answers. I'm not quite sure where it got cut off. <sighs> You see lots of people typing. Some people typing. Can you all hear me now? See people typing. Okay. Okay. Repeat from after the practice. Okay. All of the answers were not answered. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, thank you. The chat box sometimes gets a little bit lost in there. Okay, gotcha. So we will need to go back over the uh, answers again, Kathy. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So um, you've got the answers. The first one is exactly as it's shown. Uh, the second one, it we move the. Uh, let me get back to me. Move the plus sign to after the 456. And in the third option, notice that I move the multiplication sign to the right of the 123 instead of putting it to the left of the 12. Um, if I, I'm pretty sure I remember the book, the, the technical guidelines showed this problem both ways. So it's up to the individual doing it which way they would want to do it. Um, and which would work better for them. Some students probably might prefer one way, others might prefer another. But I put it that way so you could see it could be done either way. What did you say about the sign? Okay, Teresa is saying regrouping in the elementary level, it is very important that the math teacher sees the regrouping numbers. See this in the examples. Um, Teresa, I was just following what was in the book, so um, I imagine that you would put the regrouping numbers, um, but I would have to look more closely in the technical guidelines. 
obviously you could put it just above it. I'm not sure how you would do the crossing out and stuff like that. That one would be one we'd have to research together. Uh, and you should know. Uh, well, Pamela Hall asks, where'd she go? Why isn't the line in example one under the operation sign? I, I was following what the guidelines had, and that's where I said, I think it depends on which example you look in the guidebook. And that's where I was saying, I think there's flexibility with the number line or with the with the line mode um, some of the examples have it all the way over others don't um, so I think I don't know that there is a hard fast rule of where that line that line starts and stops because um, these examples were from the guidelines because like I said I, I know some but I'm still learning this content as well we're all learning together um, Numeric, All right. Numeric, but the double numeric indicator should not be over the sign, sign of operation, I'm assuming. I believe that's correct, yes. At least in the example that, the, two, the f few examples that I looked at, the numeric passage indicator and the numeric passage terminator was to the left of everything else. And Carol, I believe Kathy kind of addressed um, that there is flexibility in the line mode. And you would have to, would have to um, turn to the guidelines for technical materials. And yet, Teresa, um, I'm not sure. Like I said, there may be more information. Um, but also, and this I think brings up a good point that I was going to talk about in um, in one of the later webinars. But some of this stuff, um, if it's a guideline that Banna has out, then they want input. Um, and if you have questions and stuff like that, on the Banna website, there's a place you can write in, and someone then can start working and addressing these kinds of things. But if they don't hear it, it's not going to happen. Give the page numbers that the guidebook examples are looking at. Um, I will try and do that for you, Carol, on the next time we have a practice. While you guys are doing the next practice, I will see if I can find the page number for you with the examples. And in future, I'll try and put those page numbers on there. Okay. Do you have the guidebook, um, Carol? Okay. Yeah, she does. All right. And one thing, one thing Francis Mary DeAndrea did mention is that we do need to kind of, our students need to be flexible too. There's a lot of flexibility in this code and it actually is a really positive thing because it can meet a lot of different students' needs. Um, but yes, it creates a little confusion. Maybe you're going to get something that's um, transcribed a slightly differently. But our students need to be aware of these different ways of presenting information and our students need to be flexible too. Okay, so with that in mind and also looking at the time, um, there's the numeric space symbol. Okay, now it says there's 10 numeric space symbols, but essentially it's just dot five in front of each of the numbers. So a space before one would be dot five one, a space before two, dot five two, and so on and so forth. Um, so the 10 symbols are dot five one to dot 5, 9, and then dot 5, 0. And they have the meaning a space and following digit within a number. Spaces should be represented in this way when they are clearly numeric spaces. So, for example, and this, we don't do this as much in the U.S. as I think they do in some of the other countries, where they, they will, will write, like, ISBN numbers or phone numbers and stuff with spaces instead of with hyphens or things like that. Um, so... If it's not clear that a space is a separate a space is a separator in a single number, it should be treated as an ordinary space. So if you look at that ISBN number, obviously that number goes together. It's one complete number. And so you want to treat it as a complete number. So you put that dot five, the numeric space symbol, in there to show that that's all one number together. Same thing with that phone number. Okay, then there's the line continuation indicators, and we went over this in the other UEB webinars briefly. 
Um, sometimes you may get to a point where you have a number that will not fit on a line or and or where we covered it last time is you can use these with web addresses that are way too long to fit on one line. So the numeric line continuator indicator, um, there's two different ones that you can have, for especially for numbers that are very long. You can have one that follows a comma, so it'd be dot two for the comma, and then your actual continuation indicator would be the dot five. Or if there was a space, the space indicator is dot five, and then the continuation indicator is dot five. So if you look at it, we've got the temperature of the universe is, and I'm not even going to guess what number that is. Um, but so you've got the one zero zero comma zero 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 comma and then the dot five continuation indicator and then notice on the next line that you do not need the numeric indicator because that previous continuation symbol dot five told you that that number is continuing on the next line it's all one number still so it's not needed on that next line um, then the temperature of the universe was and it's the same thing but instead of commas you've got spaces and so instead of using the dot two dot five at the end of the line you use the dot five dot five at the end of the line now the, the dot, dot five continuation indicator is also used to break up oh I said this long electronic addresses but you'll want to break it up in a logical point like after a dividing symbol, a space, a slash, and if it's a space inside a, a web address or something like that, you'd put that dot five for the space and the dot five for the continuation. Um, now, here's a question. Why don't you need the grade one indicator before the C? Because it's not um, in the degrees. Carol's typing, Andrea. Teresa. Yeah. yeah, capital letter, that that is one thing. Um, and I guess what I was thinking more too, it, it's not standing alone either. So it can't be confused with can. It's got to be a C. You're right, it wouldn't be confused with a number because it's capitalized. But the degree sign cancels numeric mode. So, okay. Um, and I think maybe because oh, it's, gosh, it's oh, like gosh. Three guys. <laughs> I think we probably let's hold off on the simple fractions and mixed numbers, and the next webinar we'll pick back up right here with the simple fractions and mixed numbers. And we'll have, um, if you want, you can look ahead and you can work on some of this stuff and get a preview of it. But we'll have another PowerPoint that picks up right here that'll be separate. Um, and that will include the rest of these slides as well as the material we're going to cover in the next one. A star for myself. <laughs> a very awful, terrible star. It's hard to draw with the mouse. Um, Yes, uh, we don't want to get too far into the fractions and mixed numbers because there's quite a few symbols um, that you have to learn and where these different fraction indicators or fraction symbols apply. So we will stop here. I think that's a good idea, Kathy. We, as you could tell, this is like a, I think it's like 54 slides and we weren't quite sure how far we would get. But um, knowing that we had the next webinar to pick up where we left off, and then once we conclude this portion of the webinar, we will move on to Nemeth within UED context. Thank you, Deanna. Yeah, we're trying our best <laughs> to give you what you need. You got this, Mary. You can do it. It takes a lot of practice. Um, but the more the more I've practiced using UEB numbers and symbols, it comes a little easier, but still it's so hard, like Kathy said, to turn off Nimeth mm -hmm. in your brain. It is very difficult to unlearn it. Um, but you still need Nimeth, so need don't it. put it all the way back, the way back. of the back of your brain. Um, so before you all go, let me pull up the da -da 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 -da, evaluation questions for this webinar, if you all don't mind.
think everything's open. Oh, wait. Oh, no, that's sorry. the first one. Uh -huh. Oh, no. What happened to my evaluation questions? Oh, no. Okay. Well, never mind. We'll do the evaluation questions next time. Not a big deal. Um, we'll be here for the next uh, few minutes to answer any questions that you guys have. We appreciate you joining us today. Oh, you need a closing. Oh, code. And oh, that code 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 is code. code. Do you want to jump to the last slide? Oh. Maybe that'll help. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry if I'm giving you a headache. There we go. Questions, homework, evaluations. We'll do that next time. And then our next. Uh, just the facts will be on uh, January 21st and our last one on February 12th. And the closing code again of that was code, C-O-D-E. My student has to use a protractor. Any suggestions on how to adapt? Actually, there is a protractor available through American Printing House for the Blind. That has tactile markings. There's a green one and there's another one. There's a clear one that has a green uh, little yeah, knob thing yeah. that has pointer that you tighten and move. Oh, and that brings up, remember everybody, the assessment webinar is coming up. I strongly, strongly suggest if you are teaching any students that are going to be taking especially the Braille version of any of the Florida Standards assessments, Please join us for the webinar because there's some really important stuff you need to know in the Braille. Um, and that's going to be the Tuesday after Martin Luther King Day. I believe it's the 19th. Um, and Andrea has gone to see. You're still recording, too. All right. Um, here. There's this one too. That's the one I was yeah, thinking of. Let me turn on my video. Let me turn mine off so you can have. There. Hold on, let me turn my video back on. Did Michaela leave? Let's see. Nope, she's still there. Okay, Michaela, they have this one. I don't know how well you can see it. It's a clear one, and it has um, tactile markings. I actually have quite a few on my shelf. Um, I can go ahead and get it out to you. If you could just email me your, um, the address you would like it sent to. Not a problem. <clears throat> Anybody else need one? Okay, the FSA assessment webinar that is it, it's next Tuesday. I believe it's the 19th from 2 to 3.30 like the other ones. Teresa. And yeah, anybody who's got any students taking it, taking a Florida Standard Assessment in Braille, I highly, highly recommend that you attend, because um, there is some very important information in it. Um, protractor with the spare. Lisa, yes, send me the address where you'd like it sent. I'm happy to send you a protractor. Uh, Carol, yes, the UEB instruction manual does go over spatial problems. It's not, well, and I, I have to look at the new one. I had, well, when I was working on this webinar, I only had the older version of the technical guidelines from 2008, which was a lot less than the new one from 2000. I think it's from 2013, which you, Carol, have, because that was the one we created. And I just, I had gotten an early copy, and I never got a copy of the new one. Um, so it does give some examples, but I don't know how many examples it gives. You're welcome, Carol. Yeah. And the other thing you can do is, I, what, 
in putting this together, a lot of what I was doing is just turning to that section, finding the section in the table of contents, turn to that section and looking at the examples.